Hello to everybody watching. My name is Roxy Baudillon and I am the managing editor of Diva magazine. And today I'm joined by the groundbreaking activist, the influencer and the model. It is Yasmin Bonoir. Thank you so much for being with us, Yasmin. Hey, thanks for having me. Can I just start off by saying how epic you look in your <laughs> super glorious background? You look incredible. Thank you. And I'm getting a subtle, like, old school pinup vibe from you, and I'm into it. <laughs> you're getting it, and that's what that's what I'm giving, and you're receiving, and I'm getting, like, glorious asexual, like, witch goddess vibes from you, and I'm loving those. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so let's dive right in. Now, asexuality, it is sometimes described as the invisible orientation but we definitely want to change that, which is one of the reasons that we're so excited about this conversation today, because so much of the amazing work that you do is about making asexuality and aromanticism more visible. Let's just start with like asexuality 101. For anyone who might be watching this, who may not know, can you explain what those words mean, asexual and aromantic? Well, asexual just, means experiencing little to no sexual attraction i like to think of it as the sexual orientation that just isn't oriented anywhere it doesn't necessarily you don't have doesn't mean that you don't have any sexual feelings or any interest in any kind of sexuality or that you have zero sexuality it's just about not experiencing that sexual attraction or that or that like sexual desire towards other people and then a romantic is kind of the same thing but for romantic attraction because those two things don't necessarily line up so it just means experiencing little to no romantic attraction so I don't really I don't date I I don't experience romantic love I just experience all the other kinds of love <laughs> and I mean that must mean you have lots of time and you're very productive and you have you know you have a lot of energy and a lot of brain space which is brilliant I do. I like to think that. I think it's it's just something I don't have to worry about. And witnessing some other people, I feel like the process of either wanting to get laid and getting laid and trying to get the next time or trying to find a partner or being in a relationship, maintaining it and recovering from the breakup, like that sounds kind of exhausting. So I do feel like I, I just have like a few less things to worry about. <laughs> And when did you first start to realize that you might be asexual and aromantic? Uh, I mean, for me, the experience is like blended together entirely. I used to just say asexual because to me, I thought it was all part of the same thing until I realized that there are a lot of asexual people that aren't aromantic. There's aromantic people that aren't asexual. So now I use both. But I realized when I was probably like 10, it was like late primary school. And I only worked it out because it seemed like everyone else was realizing that they weren't asexual and they weren't aromantic. It's like the hormones had kicked in. And before kids, they just wanted to play together. And, and then they kind of started fancying each other and going out with each other. I don't know where you're going when you're 10, but either way, that's what people were doing. And I was like, hmm, okay, not feeling the same way. And I assumed it would kick in for me, but it didn't. <laughs> And what was that like being the one amongst your like classmates who were all suddenly sort of, you know, boy crazy, girl crazy, whatever they are, hormonally charged, feeling all these things. What was that like for you not feeling those things? <laughs> I jokingly compare it to Rick Grimes waking up in The Walking Dead and realizing that like the, the world around him had changed and the climate had changed and everyone was acting very differently and the standards had changed. It was kind of like that. I was like, okay like this is heading in a direction I'm not feeling the same way nothing else seems to be changing this is obviously the way things are going to be and I was kind of like okay I don't really get it and to me it just felt like people were being very dramatic <laughs> like you had girls fighting each other physically over boys and friendships up between boys and girls are breaking up because one fancy the other blah 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 and it's just like can we just play Lego again? We were so chilled just then. <laughs> we were all just getting along. Now it's drama. So it was a bit confusing. <laughs> and then at that time, like we mentioned at the beginning that asexuality, there isn't enough representation of it. There isn't enough visibility of it. 
were, was asexual even a word that you were aware of at that time? No, I didn't become aware of the word until I was 15. So, and I kind of, I started having this like recognition of it when I was like 10. So I didn't work out until about 2009, 2010-ish. And even that was only kind of a fluke because fortunately I was part of that Tumblr generation (laughs) where everyone's like dissecting their sexualities on Tumblr. And it it wasn't for people constantly trying to analyze me and come up with theories. And everyone thought I was gay for a while. And then someone said, maybe you're asexual or something because they'd been lurking on just the right part of the internet to come across (laughs) that word. And then I was like, oh, okay. So there is a word for it. So it was quite a... It was quite a good few years in between, but I think compared to some other people's experiences, I think I was quite lucky to work it out while I was still in school and I didn't spend like my young adult years in a state of experimental confusion. Absolutely. And then when did you feel able to kind of come out to your friends and family and talk about it with them? I mean, kind of as soon as I, 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 I never really not did it. Like I never really had like a sit down, let's all talk about what I'm not doing. Cause I was never doing anything anyway. It was no, I wasn't like I was ever acting like I was straight or acting like I was anything else. I'd said from the time people started asking, which is at a weirdly young age, people start asking you about your interests when you're still in primary school. It's like, so like in boys, blah, blah. And I would always say, no, not interested didn't have the language but I would kept I would always give the same kind of answer alluding to the same thing so I can't remember when I first was like oh yeah by the way there's a word for it it's asexual I'm asexual that's fine I think I think by that point my mom would have been more surprised if I came home with a boy than she would be by me giving a word to it because I think that would have been more of a oh I didn't think we were doing that um (laughs) But, you know, for my friends, like when I, I learned the word while I was at school, so I would quite quickly start finally giving them an answer to their questions, mm-hmm. but no one believed the answer. <laughs> so it was only half helpful to have the language when no one knows what the language means, no one understands it, no one thinks it's a real thing. And because of that, I was kind of thinking, is this even a real thing or is this a Tumblr thing? Because no one outside of the internet seems to be talking about it. So even I was thinking... Am I, is this an orientation or is this just something some kids found on Tumblr one time? It's crazy, isn't it? But that's how powerful, like that lack of visibility, that lack of representation, like it's to nowhere near the same extent. But as a gay woman growing up, not seeing that represented very often. Um, and I'm sure I had way more representation than you did, sweetheart. Um, you know, I felt the same sort of things I felt like oh is this something I can be is this you know a viable option but then for asexuality it's just extremely unrepresented and I I'd expect that there's quite a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings around it what what sort of misconceptions do you encounter well I mean I think the funny thing is is that when I was I went to an old girls school so it was a climate where everyone was a little gay So it wasn't like queerness was some far-fetched thing, (laughs) but still, even within that space, being gay, whatever, being bi, whatever, but being asexual was still a a kind of a a weird area. And I notice that even now I get the same misconceptions I get from straight people, I'll get it from queer people too. And it's, I guess, because everyone's, we're still kind of socialized the same way to understand how fundamental sexuality is in exactly the same way and that means that people think instinctively that there must be something physically or mentally wrong with you that you must have had some kind of trauma people will kind of quite quickly jump to oh so did you get abused as a child like that's a theory people will quite quickly come up with like have you seen a doctor is there medication you're on or is there medication you could be on or specifically for being aromantic they think there's something kind of spiritually wrong with you like if you're incapable of feeling romantic love then you must be like some kind of emotionless psychopath <laughs> so it's uh it, and it's uh, there's definitely a lot of pretty I've heard the craziest misconceptions I heard uh, I quite a common one I seem to get online is that it's a side effect of veganism which is really weird because I'm not vegan <laughs> but a lot of people seriously think this is what happens when you're a vegan <laughs> That's so funny. I mean, apparently lesbianism is also a side effect of veganism or or vice versa. So, you know, we're all getting these stereotypes, aren't we? My goodness. 
<laughs> so coming for the vegans. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the vegans alone. <laughs> My goodness. Um, so I mean that's horrific, isn't it? For some asexual people, that do are there like people trying to do, you know, conversion or medical interve interventions, things like that? Statistically, yeah, we are statistically quite likely to have to be subjected to conversion therapy or be offered conversion therapy. Um, I know asexual people that have went through that. It's it's not an it's, it's one of the first things people jump to. It's okay. There's something physically wrong with you. You can give you medication for that. You can try to change your mindset, and that will fix you. And some people they mean it in a you know, they're trying to be helpful, <laughs> but there's nothing physically wrong with you in the first place and giving people pills to boost their libido or try to put them in therapy for it. It's like, it's not a libido problem. So <laughs> hey, you're going to be horny, but it's still not going to be directed anywhere. It's not going to make a difference. Um, so yeah, unfortunately we are statistically pretty likely to have undergone that. If in comparison to, to some other career identities, like it's, it's, it's interesting because we're talking about the bad conversion therapy campaign. I was talking to Stonewall about that and mm. they're kind of like working with that because of how unfortunately slightly more common it is for asexual people to go through it. I just, I don't get, you know, other people's obsessions with judging and interfering in other people's lives. Like why, why, why do they need to intervene? Why do they need to put you in a box? It's very frustrating. Um, it is, yeah, and it's weird because before I kind of started the activism, I was, I was kind of under the impression that like, in comparison to a lot of other orientations, I feel like this is very easy to understand. I feel like people won't be very mad about it. And yet the more kind of activism I do, the more I see like, like they're like ace phobia, like the anti-asexual, like it's very much a thing. And the kind of the deeper you go into it, the more you see it, the more you see how angry people get at the thought of asexual people just existing, the harassment, the abuse, the conversion therapy, the corrective rape, all those things. And you're like, wow, just because people aren't talking about it that much doesn't mean that these things aren't going on. A hundred percent. And when it comes to media representation, is there any? Like I can maybe think of a couple of examples. Like I know there was a character in Emmerdale, Liv was an asexual character, and maybe there was a mention of it in Sex Education, but I can't think of many examples. What kind of media representation do you see? I mean, those are the two British examples. <laughs> That's it. Um, and then if you throw in Todd from Bojack Horseman, mm. and yeah that's kind of in terms of mainstream examples that's kind of what we've got I'm sure I know there's an asexual character in a video game and there's some in some podcasts and there's some in some independently published books but in terms of like you know kind of like well-known stuff it's it's severely lacking and Bojack Horseman's not even on anymore <laughs> and I that sex education was literally four minutes of a two season show so it's it's definitely severely lacking and then whenever it is represented they tend to lean towards kind of homely kind of girls next white girls next door or just kind of average guys and then that's kind of it like I never saw anyone even remotely similar to myself represented at all which was kind of what motivated me to start doing this because I was like I'm even going to have to spend my life waiting for some white executive to decide to create someone that seems similar to me, or I could just be my own representation. And that's kind of how it went. <laughs> Amazing. And you do it so brilliantly. Um, you've created the hashtag, this is what asexual looks like campaign, which is just glorious. Like I was having a, a look on it just before we got on this interview and just to type that in and then to be flooded with these glorious faces of all these different diverse people of different races different identities but they're all asexual that's really powerful and for asexual people who you know see such either limited or non-existent representation that's just fantastic that's really well done bravo really powerful <laughs> stuff <laughs> yeah I mean it was kind of something I also felt like was really helpful for me because I've noticed that like you know a lot of the asexual community's interaction it takes place online because there's less of us and the chances of you running into someone who's brazenly openly asexual in real life especially depending on where you live could be pretty slim and I feel like there's something weird about being part of a community that you don't physically see 
Like, at least if you're gay, you might meet a lesbian. You might meet another gay guy. Your trans person might meet another trans person. But you're, you, I've been to ace spaces where they said, this is the first time in my life I've ever seen another asexual person before. And I'm like, I feel like it's almost unhealthy to never see anybody. Not to see faces, just to see blocks of text or little avatars and stuff and not see who's actually in your community and what it really looks like. And when I was a teenager, that's one thing that made me feel like, should I use the term asexual? Cause I'm like, I actually don't know anything about this community. I've never seen anybody. And so having that as like a resource to kind of be able to see like how diverse a community actually is in, in diverse ages and diverse backgrounds and diverse ethnicities in a way that you wouldn't see it in the media. And you might not even see it if you just go on Twitter or something unless you specifically type that in and see actual faces. So I found it to be personally very helpful. And I think also for people outside the community as well, it helps to kind of break down some misconceptions and show the diversity of our expression and give some agency back to asexual people so we can represent ourselves and not have to always rely on only being seen when the media wants to occasionally show us. <laughs> and also because as a, as a black woman, I think you've written before about the fact that often black women are unfortunately hypersexualized by people. So I guess there's also some, you know, race is another intersecting element of it. And there is that kind of misconception that, oh, you, you can't be asexual and be a black woman. Or there's, there's so many different ones, isn't there? There's people who believe you can't be asexual and be, for instance, um, homosexually romantic, homo homo romantic. So I think it's just so powerful, isn't it? The way that you are defying those misconceptions. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of where like the literal, the phrasing of the hashtag came from was people saying, you don't look asexual. It's like, what do you think asexual looks like? Like, this is what asexual looks like. I know you're picturing a Sheldon Cooper, but like, that's not, like I am what an asexual person looks like. And I think that, I know, I guess just because of the way, it's, and not, it's not even just for asexuality. I think people have a hard time associating blackness with queerness in general. Mm -hmm. And then when you throw asexuality into it, so you know, people seeing as being completely desexualized when your whole identity is inherently sexualized. And then it just becomes even harder for people to kind of believe it. And whenever asexuality is represented, they tend to lean towards white people just because they find it, think it's going to be easier for people to compute. So yeah, I just try and, you know, as they say, be the change you want to see and try and just contribute to that. And I think gradually expand people's ideas and break those misconceptions in a second. I mean, the second they see me, they're like, oh, okay, this isn't what I anticipated. I feel like I need to catch up on what I thought I was going to get here. So I think it's kind of helpful in that sense. Wonderful. And as part of your amazing activism, you co-founded International Asexuality Day, which is pretty enormous, like what an achievement, well done. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? What, what made you want to do it and what that's been like so far? Well, I, well, it happened on April 6th, which was our first ever one. And it went really, really, really well, like better than I could have thought it would go. Um, I mean, it's not like I've ever really <laughs> been involved in anything like that before. You have no idea how receptive people are going to be to a day coming into existence. But I think the asexual community, we get such little visibility and there's so little to celebrate <laughs> there's so small, like, so any small victory is a good thing. And we have a week in October and we might get a mention in Pride Month, but then that's kind of only two points in a year where people might talk about us and we might have that kind of visibility or we might have that opportunity to kind of raise awareness. So it's like in the first half of the year, we could have a thing and we could do it so that it's inclusive and it's something that's coordinated and you can talk about the experiences that people have in different countries because a lot of the time people might only pay attention to what's happening in the UK or in the US, but it's like there are asexual people in Brazil and Nigeria and <laughs> Japan and India and the climate in these different countries are so different and their voices should be amplified as well and we should all be able to help each other out and kind of work together on something that will bring kind of like solidarity. So that was kind of like the idea behind it, to do something that's inclusive and representative and kind of uplift everybody. And it was very awesome to see how many platforms, including particularly the platforms outside of the ACE community that were happy to get on board and like talk about it and show like their allyship with us. And I think that that just kind of really helped to 
kind of put Except Valley on the map for a little bit and have people talk about us and bring us into the the consciousness worldwide. I mean, we're trending on Twitter, which is really cool. So, That's so cool. That's amazing. Well done. Thank you. Um, how do you feel as an asexual person when you're in queer spaces, whether they're kind of virtual online spaces or physical spaces? Do you go to pride festivals? Do you feel included there? You know what's weird? The my experiences in real life offline spaces and online spaces is weirdly different. <laughs> like I went to my first Pride when I was 14. I met my first, the first time I met asexual people was at a Pride. That's the first time I saw an asexual flag. It never crossed my mind whether or not I was supposed to be there, especially since curious straight people were just wandering in from anywhere. <laughs> so I didn't really think, okay, should I not be in this, in this space? And I've been going to them consistently since I was 14 and now I'm 24. So it's been like 10 years. And But then it's weird because now I'm like, I work in those spaces. I'll do panels, I'll do events, and then I'll talk about that same event online I'll be like oh it was really nice to speak at your LGBT STEM conference and I'll get people go you're not supposed to be there what made you think you could go there it's like uh, my invitation <laughs> so, and it's like and then online it's like I don't know I think people think that asexual people like were banging on the door desperate to get in sneaking in through the back window and it's like no like they rolled out the carpet and said please come and talk about your experience it's not taking up someone's space we're not forcibly invading i'm not trying to stop people from talking about their sexuality which is a weird misconception people think that asexuality is the same as being anti-sex therefore they think that if you're in those spaces you're just going to be stopping anyone from sexually expressing themselves or something so it's so that's kind of like it's a weird juxtaposition but it's unfortunate because for a lot of asexual people if your only experience in queer spaces is online then you're going to quickly think oh god like i'm not welcome everyone's going to hate me but if they had had that experience offline then it probably would have been a lot better but not everyone can physically go to these spaces so it's a it's a weird one Mm, it is a weird one isn't it but I mean you're part of the family you're in the you're in the acronym it's LGBTQIA isn't it so you know you should absolutely be there people are yeah people are people are tricky but if anybody is watching this and they want to be a better ally to asexual people what would you say to them I would say that well, for a start, it's always helpful to, you know, do some Googling. The fact if you've been watching this and you've probably learned quite a few things. Everyone, there was actually a, a data poll that Sky News did and they found that like, lo most people think they know what asexuality is, but then when it came down to it, like 75% got the definition wrong. A lot of people think that they know what it is, but it turns out they don't actually know what it is. So don't be afraid to like, learn more information about that and challenge yourself. And I think that, I think it's actually really helpful because I think that, it, the asexual community has kind of like a unique understanding of like sexuality and I think it's kind of helpful to kind of de-emphasize the importance of only expressing your sexuality or only experiencing it in one particular way or only understanding like romantic love and sexuality in one particular way so I think the way to be an ally is just to kind of be informed and not be threatened and not kind of make assumptions and just kind of yeah just kind of like expand your mind and just kind of be inclusive and accepting and don't place such a I think it's helpful for anyone not even if you want to be an ally but just in general don't place the importance of sexuality and experiencing sexual attraction or being in that kind of relationship as being the most important thing ever and something that needs to define your worth in general or who you are as a person like that's just one aspect of everybody and it shouldn't be the be all and end all ever I don't think <laughs> And as we can clearly see, as well as being a fabulous asexual and aromantic person, you are a glorious gothic witch goddess <laughs> with you know all this fabulousness going on. So there's a lot. There's a lot to you. There's all you. Are, you contain multitudes, and they're all fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and the last thing I'd like to ask you is if anybody is watching this interview and they think or they know that they are asexual, what words would you have for them? I would just say that there is nothing wrong with you because our society likes to try and tell us that there's something wrong with us and it needs to be fixed and that we're not going to be able to live fulfilling, connected lives and that people aren't going to get us. But none of those things are true. 
there's people out there who are going to get you. You can live a perfectly awesome life while being asexual. It's not a hindrance. It's not like a, it's not like a blind spot. It's just a different experience of sexuality. And every single person on this planet has a different one. And you have something that a lot of people share and that brings an amazing community and it's a unique experience and you should embrace it and feel empowered by it. Glorious. I love everything you just said. Yasmin, thank you so much, so much for joining us and chatting this week. If anyone watching wants to look you up, where can they find you online? You can find me at the Yasmin Benwa. So Y-A-S-M-I-N-B-N-O-I-T on pretty much everything. UK, the Yasmin Benwa Twitter, Instagram, YouTube wherever pretty easy to find and my twitter and my instagram are both verified so you know those ones were really me and yes give me a follow join the party i'm always sharing new work and, and whether it's fashion or activism whatever it's always something going on so yeah <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And thank you so much to everybody watching at home for joining in. Go and give Yasmin, go and look her up, go and give her a follow and search the hashtag. This is what asexual looks like, because it's so powerful and it's it's illuminating. It's powerful. It's gorgeous and it will improve your day. So you go and do that after you've watched this video. Thanks so much. Thank you.